Dr. Sekula asked me to talk about, about myectomy for blepharospasm. spasm. But like I said, I'm sort of a mechanic. I don't like the big words a whole lot. And so my slides won't be very wordy, but there will be a fair number of pictures in them. And there are other things besides myectomy that we have to think about when we, do, when we treat patients with blepharospasm. So if we think about a very crude sort of assessment of why blepharospasm happens, you have sensory input to the cornea. Is it abnormal? Is it not abnormal? Either way, we're, we're sort of agnostic on that. It, it can be either way. You get a blank. And then you get this perpetuation of that loop, that reflex loop, and you end up with blepharospasm, and it's uncontrolled. So what can we do about that? Um, even though you don't have that pain or you don't have that, you know, that, that stimulation, that, that noxious stimulation, how can we intervene so that you don't keep ending up with the blepharospasm? Um, by the way, all my cartoons are from the New Yorker, so that's my blanket um, copyright there. So this is a much simpler black and white version of what Dr. Evinger was showing you, like I said, I'm not good at big words, uh, for the reflex circuit. They talk about the non-geniculate vis visual pathways, and all that means is stuff that your eye senses but doesn't see. The geniculate pathway is the stuff that you see. Everything else, the sensation, or where your eye is in space, or, any, or whether your vision is double or not, all of that goes around the place that you see because your reflexes have to be faster than what you can process, process visually. So if you look here, you have your trigeminal nerve. Afferent means that it's going to the brain. So your trigeminal nerve brings in information it comes into the brainstem. It never goes all the way back to the very back of your head to the occipital area where you're actually seeing. It just goes straight through and cuts straight through to the facial nerve and says, activate, buddy. It's time to do some work. So um, in patients who have blepharospasm, most of the patients have another, type, another dystonia with it. Um, one of the studies I read said about almost 80%. It's the same percentage that will respond favorably to Botox. So Botox is mostly the miracle cure. However, sometimes we, need to, sometimes we need to tweak the Botox. So we go back to this. We go back to we have sensory input we have that causes a blink. Then we have this per abnormal perpetuation of that. And we have blepharospasm, sometimes to the point where you can't see when you want to see. Where can we interrupt this surgically? And this is where the mechanic part comes in that I love. Because you get to do stuff. And sometimes there's even power tools. So sensation. If you have a sensation of dryness or irritation, why are you getting that? You can lubricate the ocular surface, but that's no fun because that's not surgery. You can put in punctal plugs, like we talked about before, to decrease the evaporation. You can cauterize the punctum, which is sort of a permanent way to keep the tears from going away. The tears that you do have stay around longer. If you have a seventh nerve palsy, which is how some people get into this abnormal feedback loop, you can put a gold weight into the upper lid. And what that does is when you sit and think about blinking, it allows the upper lid to come down using gravity. Any eyelash misdirection that you have, you should take care of. If you have eyelashes pointing into the eye, that's going to make you want to blink and squeeze. So how can we improve the blink? Like we said, you can use a gold weight. This is a lot of what I do in my practice, is I repair the changes, the, the abnormal changes in the lid that sort of start this cycle going. You can repair an ectropion, which is where the lid turns out, or an entropion, where the eyelid turns in. And I hate even looking pic at pictures of those because the eyelashes are just scratching on the cornea. You can correct any scarring or retraction of the eyelid so that if you can't blink all the way, say because you, know, you had a facelift or you had you know, some other burn, burn to the skin, you can correct all of that so that someone can blink more effectively and you don't get this potentiation of these giant blinks later. So this is a picture of somebody with an ectropion. Now this is pretty obvious. The eyelid's sort of hanging out there looking at you. There's a lot more subtle version of this too where I can just sort of pull your lower eyelid away from your eye, and instead of snapping right back, it'll just sort of sit there. 
And if I tell you not to blink, it won't go back to the surface of the eye until you blink. And all of those things cause badness with the windshield wiper action of the eye. This is an entropy, and like I said, I hate these pictures because you can see the cornea is being scratched by these eyelashes constantly. And she has a lot of tears here because the, the lacrimal gland is just pouring out moisture to try to, try to combat this. This is a different patient, but it's immediately after the surgery to repair that, to repair the entropion. It's one of my favorite surgeries because it's immediate, the patients feel better immediately. And it's, it's a fairly uh, neat surgery to do. It doesn't, doesn't give a big scar and it works pretty well. It's about 95, 97% effective. All right, so how are we going to, how can we intervene if you don't have those things and you have normal eyelids and you, don't, you have a normal surface, but you still have this, how can I help you? Well, we could try intervening with the perpetuation of the reflex loop, that sort of going around and around and around in a circle. What they used to do was they would cut the upper branches of the facial nerve. And that caused pretty bad dry eye because then you have no ability to blink whatsoever. And you have no ability to necessarily close your eye at night. And it's a very crude, um, a very crude process. The other thing is that they usually grow back because they're peripheral nerves. Unless you take out more than a centimeter of them, which is sort of destructive, they, they usually grow back. So, they started thinking, well, how can we affect the muscles and sort of grade that the way that we want? And the real advance, like you guys all know, was chemical myectomy, which is Botox or Dysport or Myoblock, which are the, um, Xeomin is the other one that is um, available in the US, I think. Or you can go at it with the power tools and remove the muscle if maybe that's not working well enough. So we're gonna take a little sidetrack and go to when, when your eyelids are squeezing closed all the time. They start to disinsert the muscle that opens the eye. And you get ptosis. So even when we do give you the blepharospasm, your eyelids are still pretty much closed and you end up with a chin up position or you end up not able to see very well around because you just have this sort of shade effect. The way you get around that is you repair it with either reinserting the levator muscle or you do what's called a frontalis sling, which is where you um, attach it to, you attach uh, that to the muscle in the forehead so that when you, which is a completely different nerve. So when you raise the forehead, you can open your eyes. Uh, this is a gentleman who didn't have blepharospasm, but he does have ptosis. If you look at the little light reflex on the cornea right here and right here, it's worse in his left eye because the lid is almost covering it. And in the right eye, he's got maybe a millimeter and a half two millimeters between where the lid is. So we're gonna repair his ptosis. This is the first step, is we start by taking away the extra skin, and now what you're looking at here is the muscle, the orbicularis muscle, and you can sort of get the sense that the little black spots are where we've cauterized, and you sort of get the sense that you're getting this horizontal, these horizontal striations, and that's all of your orbicularis muscle. But you remember, you have some here, you have some here, and you have some down here. So now we're coming down and we're finding the muscle that opens the eyelid. So here's our orbicularis muscle here in our hook. And this is the muscle that opens the eyelid. And this little white piece of tissue here is the tendon that holds it in. So if this is always squeezing, this is gonna get weaker. And what we, this tendon here is gonna get weaker. The muscle will work fine, but the tendon isn't attached anymore. So what we do is go in and put some stitches in this tendon to reinsert it. And that's a really common thing in patients with blepharospasm. So you can see him intra-op is how we, this is how we adjust it during the surgery. You can see all of the uh, sutures are still here and above his eyelids. And we adjust the eyelids to where he can open them, but they still close. And then we actually do cut the strings and sew the, sew the skin closed. So the other operation that we talked about, a frontalis sling, we can take and attach the edge of the eyelid with a stitch under the skin up to this muscle here, all the way up to the brow. And we do this on little kids all the time, so that when you raise your eyebrow, it completely overcomes any apraxia of eyelid opening or any ptosis.
So another little sidetrack, apraxia violet opening. What are we going to do with that? Well, there are lots of, things, lots of ways that we can address that. And the reason I'm stalling to get to myectomy is because myectomy should be our last resort. That should always, that's, that's an irreversible procedure, and it, should, it has complications, and it should always be our last resort. We want to fix everything back to its anatomic position before we go taking out stuff. So if you have apraxia of eyelid opening, you have this abnormal continued inhibition of the levator. Uh, they've already talked about the different neurologic conditions. Uh, somebody looked at uh, Rick Anderson, who does more of these myectomies than anybody because I think he originated the procedure, uh, it talked about in 100 consecutive myectomy patients, 88% of them had this apraxia of eyelid opening as a cause for their failure of Botox. So you first thing you do is you try Botox. If it doesn't work, or if it works, but you still have difficulty opening the eye, then you have to overcome any ptosis, either by a frontalis sling or levator reinsertion, and that's a, a technical decision on our part. And then after that, you can extirpate or take completely excise the orbicularis, which is the muscle that's causing the abnormal blinking. So. As a picture of just isolated orbicularis, and it always looks exactly like this when you do surgery. I'm just kidding. No, it's, it's much messier than this. Um, so this is the part that we call the pretarsal orbicularis. And this is the part that is probably more the culprit in blepharospasm. It's in front of the stiff part of, parts of the eyelid here. Then we have a preceptal orbicularis, which is sort of right outside. It's the circle around, or the oval around that. And those are both responsible for your reflex blinks. So this is what Dr. Evinger talks about. When you get a dry spot on your cornea, you have a reflex blink. And you do this all the time when you're talking to people. You don't, you don't know that that's happening. That's a normal reflex thing that happens. But when you see a big house fly coming in and you go to, to you know, squeeze your eyes closed so that he doesn't fly into your eye, what you use more is the orbital portion, and that's the part that's that's farther out. That's more involved in forced closure. So the reason that's important is because you can either do a limited myectomy where you just take away the pretarsal part, or you can do where you take away the pretarsal part and you take away the preceptal part, or you can do an extended myectomy where you take away all of the orbicularis that you can find plus This muscle right here, which is called the procerus, and then there's another muscle that underlies the eyebrow here called the corrugator. And all of those things are responsible for helping force the eyes closed. But like I said, I think that we probably ought to try to fix anything that's anatomically wrong first before we go taking out tissue. So this is a sagittal section of the eyelid. And the reason I'm showing you this is because this is to show you that if we cut sort of vertically in the eyelid and we look at the orbicularis, the orbicularis muscle, which is the muscle that squeezes the eye closed, is going in and out of the screen here. What is parallel to the screen is the levator muscle, which opens the eyelid. You can, and that's these little wimpy fibers here. So if you keep squeezing this and pulling down on this, it's going to pull, it's going to pull that levator tendon out of where it belongs. So orbicularis myectomy, we do through the same incision that I showed you for the ptosis surgery. We do it in the eyelid crease. And instead of going to find the, the levator muscle, we just remove all of the orbicularis that we can find. The tricks to doing it are you want to try to get rid of as much orbicularis as you can, and you want to try not to harm the eyelash follicles, because you have to go all the way down to the eyelid margin, and that's where the follicles live. And if you get too close, that's one of the complications is you can lose, you can have a little bald spot in your eyelid. The success rate, most people, the overwhelming number of people who have this feel that there are both short-term benefits, meaning immediately I feel better, and long-term benefits. Usually, about half the time, I'm, you still are going to need Botox, but it, they're probably the injections are going to be longer lasting or they're going to be, uh, you're going to need less of it. It's so it seems to potentiate that. And I find that also with the patients that I repair their ptosis or their dermatochelasis, which is the extra hooding of the eyelid skin. That can come just from, you know, genetics or sun or 
um, you know, being, being in Pittsburgh. If, if the, any of those things, that, you can take that away and do that surgery, and it often does help potentiate the blepharospasm. Or I'm sorry, but potentiate the Botox treatment so that you don't need as much or you don't need it as often, or it cut, the onset is faster. So why, why would we actually do this surgery? Well, we've tried everything else, and we've gotten to this point. The Botox has failed. You have patients who can't afford or tolerate Botox. Now, all of you guys who get Botox are sitting there thinking, well, I have to go through it, and I have to go through all these needle sticks. Well, why shouldn't somebody else? Except that if you think about somebody who has a mental disorder or some other type of disorder where they just can't sit still to do it and you have to put them to sleep every time you do that, it may be a better option to just put them to sleep once, do the myectomy. Um, it, affording, hopefully, will get better, that it will be covered because it's a medical condition. Um, any cosmetic deformities that the, the uh, Dr. Anderson talks about the cosmetic deformities of blepharospasm. Um, and I, what he's mostly talking about is um, dermatochelasis, where you have all of that extra skin hanging over. And we also use it for apraxia of eyelid opening. If you can't fix that just by fixing the ptosis and by putting Botox into the pretarsal orbicularis, then you end up usually having to excise that orbicularis. And once again, what we're after when we excise this is all of this tissue here. Everything between skin edge, which is here, and the levator, which is right, this, this white tissue here. This yellow stuff is orbital fat. So what are the complications? What trouble can you get into? Well, uh, ligophthalmos means I like a rabbit, and it means you can't blink. Because they used to say that rabbits sleep with their eyes open, and they don't necessarily. They just have a really good um, nictitating membrane, which is you have a little remnant of it over here medially in the eye. And um, when you don't close your eyes, it's called ligophthalmos. And the, about 20% of people, especially early on, had that problem. Most of these could be treated with just lubrication, saying, hey, use your tears six times a day. 20% um, of, of those people needed to have release of some scarring in the eyelid, because if you take out the muscle, it causes a lot of bleeding, and it causes the skin to stick. Um, about 10% of them could get away with just tightening the lower lid, which is a little tiny quarter-inch incision here in the corner of the eye. They had skin necrosis, meaning an area of skin lost its blood supply and just died in 2% of them. But that, um, that was sort of a transient thing. That, the eyelid heals so well that that didn't end up being a long-term problem. And sometimes they would get a hematoma, which is a big bruise, or you get a big expanding hematoma underneath where you actually have to go back in, open your incision, suck out the clot, and then close it again. Again, not tragic, but it's sort of a pain. And as my dad would say, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. 